What's up, Love Tribe? Thanks for tuning into today's show where we welcome back Wendy Dumbroff. And Wendy is a licensed professional counselor in a private practice in Madison, New Jersey, where she specializes in individual family couples and sex therapy. And that is exactly what we are talking about on today's show is sex therapy. Yeah, we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of walk through the steps of what it's like to go to a sex therapist. If you're thinking about going, who should go, who should consider it, and what happens once you go. Even if you don't feel like you want to go, there's a lot of valuable stuff because hopefully if you're listening to this and in a relationship or not, uh, you're going to be having sex in the near future (laughs) today tonight after this podcast whenever and there's a lot of things to think about even if you're not in a relationship examining your own sexual history some things like that that Wendy talks about so a lot of value in today's show And as always, thank you so much for tuning in, for sharing the episode with your friends, for supporting our sponsors, because if you support them, that helps us support you in providing you this show for free. So we appreciate you guys and we hope you enjoy today's show. Today's show is brought to you by our online course, Spark My Relationship. Create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days. We've collaborated with 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. To unlock a special offer only for I Do Podcast listeners, visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock. That's sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock. Hi, Wendy. Thanks so much for joining us back on the show. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Chase. Thanks so much for having me back. I really, really appreciate it. We thought we could use today's episode to dive into sex therapy and give kind of an outline of what it's like going to sex therapy. Maybe if our listeners are on the fence about going, just walking us through that whole process and who it'll benefit, common things that come up in sex therapy. We're curious as well. We we go to therapy, but not in particular uh, sex therapy. So maybe we could start with Mm -hmm. that particular distinction. Like, when should someone go to a sex therapist instead of just maybe regular therapy? Mm, that is such a great question. And I'm so glad that you're bringing this uh, to the forefront because I think sex in and of itself is such a stigma thing still, you know, sometimes to even talk about, even for couples to talk about. And and the idea of sex therapy can be so scary. It's like, oh, wait a minute. What do you mean? I have to go to sex therapy and what's going to happen there? And some people even think, oh, my God, do I have to take my clothes off? You know, what's what's going to happen? So I'm so glad that you're bringing this up because it's it's um, I welcome the opportunity to educate people on that. Um So I'll dive right into your question. What is sex therapy all about? So I want to say up front, sex therapy is talk therapy. There is nothing that happens in a sex therapist's office that ever involves taking off your clothes or um, being watched by the therapist uh, in any way. It's talking. We can talk about anything. We can talk about what you like. We can talk about what you don't like. We can talk about what gets in the way of sex, what bothers you about your body, your fantasies, your thoughts that think that make you think you're crazy and the only person that ever had this thought. Um, we can talk about anything, but it is first and foremost talk therapy, and it does not go beyond that. Not to say that there aren't exercises I may ask couples to do, like holding hands or even having a hug in the office, if they are comfortable doing that. But nothing ever goes beyond the client's comfort zone. And so I just want to put that right out there uh, in case anybody was wondering, because I know I've come across many people who have wondered. Excellent. 
So second, we're keeping yeah, our clothes on. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> you keep your clothes on. You don't have to don't have to worry about that ever. Um, so secondly, so what is sex therapy, and why should someone come to a sex therapist? Well, a lot of the reasons that I see people, there are many reasons. One of the most common reasons that brings couples to sex therapy is something called discrepant desire, which is one person wants sex more than the other. That's the most common in couples. Other things bring people to sex therapy. Sometimes a couple is just not having sex and they don't understand why. It's like we love each other, we care about each other, uh, but we just don't have sex and we don't, we don't know why. Sometimes it's uh, uh, some sort of erectile dysfunction with men. Either they can't get an erection or they can't maintain an erection or perhaps there's issues around premature ejaculation. Sometimes different sexual styles and preferences bring people to sex therapy. For example, one person wants kinky sex and the other person totally isn't into kinky sex. Um, So there's many different things that can bring people uh, to sex therapy, including histories of abuse and uh, trauma around sexual issues, which shows up in their current sexual relationships, very common. Um, So there are many reasons for people to come to sex therapy and why a sex therapist, you know, many couple, it's interesting in our education as therapists, couples therapy and sex therapy are two separate uh, entities. They are not taught together. So in order, so I am, I trained to be a couple therapist and I, I recognize that a lot of people come and they also have sexual issues, which is one of the reasons I went and continued to train to be a sex therapist because I wasn't quite sure how to deal with all of those issues. So I think that when it's something really, not that many couple therapists can handle sex therapy and depending on their comfort with the topic as well, because that also is an issue even for therapists. So um, if you, I would encourage people if they really do have something sexually specific that is bothering them and it is relational to find someone who is a couples and sex therapist, just because they'll be able to better guide them and help them through the process. So what actually happens when they come into the office? Well, I I like to, of course, get an idea from each person's perspective, whether it's for a general couple's issue or around a sexual issue. But how do each of them see the problem? Because we could have five people in a room around, you know, a family, say, around some issue going on, and everyone's going to have a slightly different perspective. So I'd like to hear from each person what their perspective is on what the problem is is. And I like to find out a little bit about what's going on in the relationship. And um, a lot of times what emerges is that there's other issues in a relationship. And of course, if you're in conflict all the time, people are not necessarily going to feel like having sex. So sometimes First, you have to go through the relationship itself and see what's going on. And is anything there creating a block to sexual connection and a loving and intimate connection? And intimacy is certainly many people are going to describe differently. Um, So what's going on there? And sometimes there does need to be some work on the relationship itself before we can even get to sex therapy. But sometimes even if a couple comes in and their relationship is fine outside of sex, or we do some work and we get them to a better place, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sexual relationship automatically improves. Oh, okay, we're not fighting anymore and we know how to communicate better and we understand what's happening for each other and how we trigger each other and we can better deal with that. But guess what? We're still not having sex. So when when I am specifically working with couples around their sexual issues, I do a sexual history with each member of the couple. And that is usually anywhere from two to four or five sessions, maybe six, um, depends on the person's uh, his personal history. And I do those separately I, because I want people to have the freedom to 
to speak openly. And sometimes that changes if their partner is there, uh, you, you know, to really be able to ask questions about attraction and things they'd like to do or things they have done in the past with other partners that they really enjoyed that may not be happening with their current partner. What, whatever it is, I think everyone can understand there's things they may fe- feel more comfortable saying alone uh, than they would saying in front of their partner. So in the service of doing the most in-depth and thorough um, sexual history, uh, I like to do them separately. I ask couples, I ask them to sign on if they are comfortable for what is told to me in an individual session is private to the extent sense that their partner tells me it's private. So for example, I would ask them at the end of the session, we've talked about a lot of things today. Is there anything you wouldn't want me to bring back to the couple session? And there may be. And that also may mean, and couples need to understand that I may hold a secret. For example, if someone's having an affair or they had an affair 10 years ago, but it had no meaning to them and, and they don't ever want their partner to know about it because it wouldn't serve a purpose, right? There's some things they may say like, oh, I have this fantasy about something or other, but I'm not really comfortable with my partner knowing that. So that may end up staying private or I may work with them to say, can you tell me what it would mean to bring this? What do you worry about if your partner knew this? Why is it something that you would not want to incorporate into your relationship with your partner? So I may work with someone to bring things they feel are important to keep private, private, but ultimately it is the individual client's um, choice as to what stays private and what doesn't. And as long as both members sign on to that, then I'm good with that. If they don't, then it's a different track, right? Then the couples know up front that anything that is said in the individual sessions is fair game for the couple sessions. Um, Most people do agree to have the information private because I think they feel more comfortable being able to say, okay, I want to be able to say what I want to say. How often do you find working with couples that there isn't an issue outside of the sex being that they come in for sex therapy, but the issue is bigger than that. It's other relationship issues. How often is, yeah, it seems like that would be Uh, pretty common. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I would say almost always, (laughs) almost (laughs) always there, there is, there is something relational. There is something in their history together or, there is something unconsciously unknown that plays in the background. Um, it may not even have been a sexual trauma or element of their history, but it can manifest sexually. And it possibly could have been a sexual trauma in their history um, or some sexualizing, for example, sometimes parents sexualize their children and the whole idea of uh, that plays in the background in the unconscious one of one of my mentors in the field her name is Suzanne Iacenza and she always says that she has a saying that says all sex is group sex because we bring with us unconsciously all of our relationships each of us into the bedroom And they're all at play there. (laughs) And so it may be two people, but everything that has ever happened in our our world, our experiential world of feelings and and things we've done, things that have been said, you know, our whole experience comes with us along with all the relational patterns and happenings from that. So it's a great question. There is it's it's usually never as simple as okay, you're just not having sex. Sometimes it is. Sometimes, you know, you're tired, exhausted, especially a young couple um, navigating young kids. And, you know, by the time they get home from work and, and, and handling kids all day and homework, they're just exhausted. So that, that is definitely an element as well. 
before we move on, because I want to keep going through the therapy steps. Sure. Um, how do you look at the relationship? And this might be just your personal opinion, but between like a loving relationship and sex, because it's so interesting to me because like sex is like this primal thing to procreate, but it's also a thing to bond and be intimate and mm. express love or, or not. It could be purely pleasure and, and physical. So <laughs> I know that's mm-hmm. a bit broad and not an exact question, but, but like, how do you, how do you look at that and think about that working with, with people? Mm, that's a very interesting question. So just clarifying a bit, are you saying how do you navigate the primal desire along with the emotionally intimate part of sex or how do you separate them slash connect them? I guess, or yeah, like what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, like if you do separate them or it's just something that's interesting to me because that you know, it's just this primal drive, like that you don't Mm -hmm. even think about, but then you think about it a lot. If you're in a relationship or like why it's not the way you want it to be or why it's not frequent enough. And, and it's, it's pretty unique. It's obviously very Mm -hmm. unique, but it's, it's an area that Mm -hmm. has that particular, yeah. Do you separate that? Um, But it seems like they're not separate. At times. Yeah, they're, you know, they're separate and they're together, I think. Um, And a lot of times, and I'm going to be very sexist here and generalize, uh, but a lot of times when, you know, men will say, you know, I'm not going to live my life without sex or we're not having sex enough. And, and why doesn't she have sex with me? And what I always try and, and women are like, well, I don't feel connected to him. How can I, how can I have sex with him if I don't feel connected to him. And again, I know I'm generalizing here because it's not always like that. So I want to just put that out there. Right. So is that that part of what you're saying? A little bit of that? Like, yeah, yeah. Like what what, what do you think about that? Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't think it's either, or I think it's both. And I think you need to deal with both of those issues. Um, understanding, yes, the normal human need and drive and primal urge for, for sex and pleasure, and then the emotional intimacy parts of it, the, you know, the physical intimacy and the emotional intimacy. And, and often what I ask it, people when they come in and they tell me, you know, we're not having sex is, well, what does it mean to you that you're not having sex? And, and very often, interestingly, what I've heard from men uh, say is, uh, it means she doesn't love me or she's not attracted to me. And that's not at all necessarily the case for women. But often I've heard from men in that case, you know, when she doesn't have sex with me, I feel like I don't feel loved. Having sex is the way I feel loved. Um, And women say, well, I can't have sex with you if I don't feel connected to you. And when you're not present for me or you're, out, you know, with your buddies, instead of being home, helping me with the kids, I don't, the last thing I want to do is have sex with you. So um, I think they work together. And, and always what's important underneath is, is the, the meaning to people. What does it mean that your partner um, is not having sex with you? One example of meaning there is when men have erectile difficulties, I have never met a woman who doesn't think, well, he's clearly just not attracted to me. You know, why would he not be able to get an erection or keep an erection if he was attracted to me? You know, that's, you know, so, so, so much of this has to do with uh, the meaning of people about having sex. And I don't know if I'm fully answering your question and I apologize for that because it's a very broad piece that is woven into everything. So throughout the exploration, I'm looking for emotional meanings, physical meanings, physical needs. And also, by the way, helping couples to redefine sex because, you know, sometimes, for example, with older couples where maybe there's been, you know, men have had prostate cancer or they're not able to have an erection. Um, 
there there are ways of still engaging intimately and having what I would call sex, but it may not be penetration the way you had sex in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s or wherever it was that you had your your issues and your problems. Um, and there are newer models of sex. Actually, up in Canada, there's they give a lot of uh, money for sex therapy, and there are women up there that do studies on this. And some of the newer models, as opposed to the Masters and Johnson's model of the '60s, which says you, you know, every you know everybody kind of dives in all hot and heavy and and has an orgasm at the same time, and you know, and all those people were in their 20s. And what they the models now are saying is that sex does not have to end in orgasm, but that it can end in pleasure, it can end in feelings of emotional connection. Um, it can it 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 does not have to look like sex did. And that becomes very important as, as couples age, especially, or their bodies are changed through disease and, and other issues. So I think what I'm always doing is weaving the physical drive heart along with the emotional, uh, the emotional parts of it as well. So it's a great question. And it's so complex and interwoven, I think, is what I kind of is I'm realizing myself mm-hmm. in the moment. Before we continue on, we want to tell you about today's sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Uberlube. Uberlube is a luxurious, high grade silicone lubricant made from clean, body friendly ingredients. It's just silicone with a little vitamin E and leaves a velvety finish that actually moisturizes the skin. In the past, I haven't always had the best reactions to lubes, and I always thought all lubes were the same. But I was very wrong. Since Uber Lube is made of silicone, it stays on the surface of your skin and doesn't enter your bloodstream like water-based lubes. So now, not only am I comfortable, but we have the right amount of slip and skin-to-skin sensation. Uber Lube offers long-lasting performance when you want it, then quickly dissipates without leaving that sticky residue. It Yuck. really feels <laughs> like a nice moisturizer when you're finished. And Uber Lube is latex compatible, so it's safe and effective to use with condoms. Hashtag safe sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not only us that loves Uber Lube. Thousands of doctors recommend Uber Lube as their go-to solution for patients' experience and dryness. And we can all go through that from time to time. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So try Uber Lube. Their simple ingredients list makes it widely used by people with sensitivities like myself to those other lubricants. So right now they're offering I Do Podcast listeners a special offer, 10% off and free shipping when you use our code I Do at uberlube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping. Just use the code I Do at uberlube.com. That's uberlube.com. Can you guess what the most stressful thing I experienced when we were planning our wedding was? What? Me? Me? Asking for different color flowers. Asking too many questions. No, not feeling organized or having a place, central place where I can store and locate all of our important details of our wedding. Unfortunately, Zola was not around when we got married, but now it is. So all you engaged couples out there need to check out Zola. Zola makes wedding planning so much easier and less stressful with their wedding websites, registry, invites, and guest list manager all in one place. Their free wedding websites offer hundreds of gorgeous designs and can be created in minutes. And just a few features I think are awesome are the FAQ section, online RSVP page, and a place where your guests can shop your registry right on your site. Zola is the highest rated registry of all time, and it's pretty clear why. You can register for gifts, experiences, and honey funds, which we both love. You can add gifts from other stores and sync existing registries. And there are amazing benefits for your guests like free shipping and returns, price matching, group gifting, which is such a cool idea, and a 20% off post-wedding discount. 
Zola also offers beautiful and affordable invites and paper. You can shop all your wedding paper needs on Zola from your save the dates to invites and thank yous. And they'll help you collect addresses and track online RSVPs with their free guest list manager. Zola has helped 1 million couples get married and they'll help you too. Go to Zola.com slash I do today and use the promo code SAVE50 to get 50% off your save the dates. You can also get a free personalized paper sample before you purchase. That's 50% off save the dates at Zola.com slash I do and use the promo code SAVE50. would love if you could expand a little bit more on, on where you're going with the redefining sex and maybe not necessarily from a, a place of, well, I guess you can really go with it. But for example, Chase and I have been together for 11 years and our sex life now is a lot different than it was 11 years ago. We've been to get, been in a long-term mm-hmm. relationship. We have a child. And so we're kind of in the phase mm-hmm. of like figuring out our new sex life. And so could you mm-hmm. maybe give us and our listeners who are maybe in a long-term relationship some guidance on navigating redefining sure. sex for them at, at this current stage in their relationship? Oh, sure. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, so for example, right, as you guys know, 11 years later, it's not the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one small thing, not, not a small thing. It's actually, a, it sounds like a small thing, but it's a very big thing that's come out of the research from Canada is the concept of willingness. And so often when couples are just so tired, right, they are like, we just can't do this, right? Just the willingness to engage. If you can start with willingness, often desire follows, right? There is responsive desire and you kind of remember, oh, yeah, this feels good. This is why we like to do this. But another thing beyond that is also expanding your sexual menu, sitting down, writing out everything you'd like to do that you feel connected by from the most vanilla to the most kinky thing that you could think of that you might like to try. And maybe not. Some people just like vanilla sex. Some people have sat in my office and said, oh, I think we're boring. We just are vanilla. I'm like, there's nothing boring about that. There's nothing boring at all about vanilla sex. And you can even experiment within the the bounds of of vanilla sex. Um, So everything from taking a walk on the beach, holding hands, right? That's something that makes you feel emotionally connected. If that's something that makes you feel emotionally connected and just having a little time for yourself, organizing time for yourself to the kinkiest thing you might like to try. Oh, you know, I want them to tie me up or I want to try X, Y, or Z or whatever it is. But sometimes it's about having the conversation about that, right? Finding out that, oh, my husband has this fantasy about uh, meeting me in a bar and pretending I'm a stranger and taking me home, right? And maybe someone will be open to that. Maybe they won't. Or my husband has this desire for me to dominate him or my wife will wants to be dominated in a way and in a certain way. And that would be a real turn on for her. And so sometimes it's bringing some of the fantasy to the forefront, understanding that and redefining also in a way, as I said before, that sex does not always have to end in orgasm, that you can have closeness and touch, but just end in a feeling of connection or a feeling of emotional closeness. Does that help yeah. to answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, it, it's really just coming from a place of finding what works for you and your partner mm-hmm. now in this current moment versus yeah. thinking about exactly. the past and what used to work and what doesn't work now. It can feel very daunting. Right. Right. Yes. I love how you, you emphasize that it, you try to find out what, it means to the individual because I think Mm -hmm. so often we hear in society and we see in the media, it's supposed to be a certain way. We're supposed to feel a certain way. We're supposed to be doing it 
once a week, three times a week mm-hmm. is what healthy couples do, like whatever mm-hmm. it is. And that's all, it doesn't matter because it's, what does it mean mm-hmm. to you? It, you can have a healthy relationship and have sex once a month. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. That, Absolutely. Yeah. But, but for me personally, you know, I'm just projecting like for me, there is a link between a healthy relationship and a healthy sex life. And it's almost mm-hmm. like I ask myself, why, why do I think that? Is it because I primarily in my genes, like that's what I need? Or is it because I think that that's what is supposed to be happening? So it's, I think it's important to examine why mm. you think your mm-hmm. sex life should be a certain way. Mm. That's a really good point. And, you know, a lot of that, what you just said, and it kind of brings me into the sexual history, back to the sexual history. Um, as I understand, you know, how was sex talked about in your family? How, what were the messages you got about sex in your family growing up from your, the larger culture around you, from your church or synagogue? What, what were the messages about sex? And because all of that gets packed into the meaning of sex. Um, all of those messages that maybe we, we never give a thought to now, but unconsciously it's there, right? Um, I've worked with some people in the more, uh, observant sides of their religion, whether it's Judaism or fundamental Christianity and you, you know, where things like uh, masturbation are, Um, frowned upon. So imagine having shame every time a person masturbates, right? And then all the shame comes in. So meaning is packed into um, this. And and sometimes you're right, Chase, that people aren't even aware that there were these meanings there. And so unpacking the whole thing, um, their whole idea, understanding the sexual history really helps people to know how they became the sexual being that they are. And when a man can realize, oh, you don't want to have sex because you're so tired, but you're willing to cuddle with me and hold me, and you do love me, and I can still feel close to you, um, and the woman doesn't feel pressured for sex, and so it becomes safer to move closer to their partner, uh, that can change a whole dynamic. And then sometimes lead to more sex just by just by that dynamic changing. So you've got the couples, you've gone through each of their sexual histories, and then what are the next steps? So the next the next steps and the sexual histories are very involved. I just want to, you know, go through their relationship histories. Um even if they're comfortable talking about their fantasies, if they use porn, what do they like in porn? You know, really just understanding who they are as a sexual being, along with the family messages around sex and also their whole, their, all the family messages. That, that I do with all couples, by the way, you know, understanding what are the messages of it's spoken and unspoken that they got from the families they grew up in and from the culture they grew up in. So, so what are the next steps? The, the next steps, um, bringing the couple back together. Uh, and it depends on where the couple is sexually. Sometimes a couple may be having sex, but they just want to have more sex or one person likes the kind that wants a different kind of sex. And so I might work with them initially on expa- writing down their menus and expanding their menus. Another couple may not really have touched much in years. And so we start some behavioral activities, which include things like for a couple that hasn't touched in years, it may just start with giving a hand massage to each other or a foot massage. Uh, whereas a couple that is having sex, but maybe just not as much sex as they want to, um, it may start with touching each other's bodies without clothes on, or maybe starting with clothes on, or just with their underwear on, or not touching genitals at first, and then adding in genitals. It really, it depends where the couple is as far as 
how disconnected they are from each other physically and what they're comfortable with. So some couples that I've worked with, really, we do start with just a hand massage. So, so when we do that, this is how it's done. And it, again, it's not, this is not about giving the best hand massage. This is about, it becomes a, a mindful exercise in touch. And so people are, let's say, for example, I would give them a, a, um, a homework assignment to do this hand massage to each other. So one person would be the giver. The other would be the receiver. They'd set a timer for five minutes. They're going to be the giver. The other person's going to receive. At the end of that five minutes, they're going to write down what they were thinking, what they were feeling emotionally, and what they were feeling in their body. And again, I, I, this is an exercise in mindfulness. It's pure mindfulness. It's also something that my mentor, Suzanne Iacenza, has taught and, and uh, I have I also use. Um, and there are many ways to do this. There are other people do this differently with other attend to temperature, pressure, and, t- and uh, things like that, and, and the sensation, the texture. But I think that when you do that, you also lose the emotional experience of what's happening, and you lose like what is going on in my mind. Now, oh, I find myself always worrying when I'm doing this hand massage if he's enjoying it or if he likes it or if he or she wants me to stop or I don't want to be doing this. I I don't want to touch this person. I feel disgusted. He had an affair. I don't want to touch his hands. Where have these hands been? Right. So it all. So so that's one of the things that we look at. What are they thinking, feeling, and what are they experiencing in their body? And then they switch. After five minutes, they they each write down what it was like to be the giver or the receiver. Then they switch, and then they write down what it was like to on the opposite side of it. So, and that is a slow progression. It, It progresses at the people's pace. If they need to do hand massages, for six months or a year, and they can't move beyond that, then that's what I would stay with. If they feel that they can do the hand massage and then move on to include the arms, maybe do a foot massage and the legs. Maybe they're ready to touch bodies without breasts and genitals with their clothes on and slowly move forward. And again, always attending to the mindful experience and when you do that, you know, what am I adding on to this experience? Oh, I don't, I, he's touching my body. I'm not comfortable with my body in that place. Oh, I hate when he touches my stomach because I feel so overweight, right? So many women have um, issues with their bodies and they, they don't, they literally don't want their partner, not only not to touch their body, but even see their body because they're not comfortable with the way it looks. And so when you're doing that, when you're experiencing that, how are you really going to let go into the sexual experience and enjoy yourself when all you're thinking is, oh, my God, this is what's happening for me, right? I don't want him to touch me. And so it's, it's about being able to notice that, come back to the moment. Can I just be with the touch? Can I just be with the touch? Can I just be with the feeling of pleasure? And again, that gets talked about in the couple's therapy, right? So that the partner can understand what is going on for, in this case, their their wife or, or girlfriend. And maybe there's something he can do to reassure her and say, no, I love your body or I'm enjoying touching your body. That would be useful. Or maybe he had no idea that the reason she didn't want to have sex with him is because she doesn't want him to see or touch her body because it doesn't look the way she wants it to look. So there's so many things that are brought forth and and we discuss all of that in the couple's therapy. One of the things uh, I'd like you to elaborate on, you've mentioned it a couple of times, is how just doing action can lead to behavior change. Like sometimes we may, we may be tired, but you called it willingness, just starting. And willingness. Then, and it, that's the interesting thing about sex is it's conscious and unconscious. Like you can be stimulated unconsciously or consciously. So 
sometimes it seems like you're saying like, you may not feel like doing it, but start and then you're going to feel like doing it. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So willingness is a big deal and it can be applied to a lot of things. It can be applied to dieting. It can be applied to, uh, well, no, because with dieting, it still doesn't always feel good, right? With sex, you get a benefit, right? You realize that if you just be willing, desire can follow. So there's, there may not be desire present. I have no desire to engage in a sexual encounter with you right now. There's no desire to do it. I have no arousal. There's nothing going on here. And, but am I willing? Because I see that you really want to, can I be willing right now? Okay. I love you. I care about you. I can be willing. And then what, happens is something called responsive desire. And again, I'm, I am generalizing here and being sexist, but women often experience more responsive desire, whereas men, a man may have a higher, naturally have a higher sex drive. And that's another issue around sex drive. Some people do have higher sex drives than others. Um, I've seen women, postmenopausal women who tell me, I want to have sex with him all the time, but he just, he never, he just doesn't want to have sex that much. So it can go both ways. Um, you know, people always say, oh, women after menopause, they don't want to have sex at all. Mm, not true. Definitely not true. So, uh, not true for everybody, for some, maybe, but again, willingness can come in and say, okay, I'm willing. I'm willing. You really want to. I really don't, but I can be willing. And then responsive desire comes in and you realize, oh, this, this does feel good. I, I enjoy this. And this is why I want to do this. I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I was willing. I think it's an important tool to have because if you're always just kind uh -huh. of like, oh, I'm going to wait till I'm in the mood or I'm not in the mood and your partner uh -huh. is like you guys, partners are not the same. So yeah, there'll be times that you're both ready to go, but probably more often than not, it's not exactly the same. So I, th I think that's a, a really great mm -hmm. tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in one lecture. It was it was really quite amusing. But the I can't remember who it was teaching, but she said uh, she said, you know, it's not like imagine if you had to go to the bathroom and you said to your partner, come on, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's we're going to go to the bathroom now. Right. Not everybody has their bodily fun occur at the same time. Fortunately, with sex, we can have willingness and we can decide, make a decision to engage. Yeah. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for walking us through kind of the process of going to sex therapy, what happens and giving us some great tools uh, that we can use even if we're not currently seeing a sex therapist. Before we wrap up, mm -hmm. are there any things that you want to emphasize or maybe that we miss uh, when it comes to sex therapy? Uh, I think the, the only thing I would think um, to add to what I've said is that when I do those sexual histories, I really look for areas where in some way people felt shame around sex around their sexuality or uh, how, what the meaning of sex was. And, and a lot of times those shameful experiences play in our unconscious. And so bringing them forth and helping people understand them can be very useful in helping them create a new story, a new narrative for themselves around what it means to be a sexual being that does not include the shame. I think that's one of the most important things. And, and as well as, and which is also can be a part of shame, um, any people who have had their sexual boundaries crossed in any way um, is also a really important uh, piece of this because that can um, really create so many issues consciously and unconsciously. And, and lastly, I would just end by saying that nobody can really help what turns them on, right? We can't help what turns us on. And, and there is no shame in what turns anybody on as long as it is something that occurs between consenting adults. So there's, there's really nothing that is wrong with your sexuality or your gender expression for that, for that matter. 
Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing that and and for leaving us with those final notes. And before we wrap up, can you tell our listeners where they can find uh, more information about you online or how to reach out to you? And then we'll say goodbye. Oh, sure. Uh, So my website is wendydumbroftherapy.com. It's uh, Wendy with an I. Um, Or they can find me at 973-937-8651. And uh, yeah, that's me. I'm in New Jersey in Madison. Perfect. Well, we'll have the links to your website uh, and your number on your show notes page on our website at idopodcasts.com. And thanks again for taking the time to come back on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Chase, for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to today's show. As always, all the links are in the podcast description and on our website. So if you are dying to check out our new podcast series, Love Under Quarantine, you can click those links in the episode description and get access immediately. The podcast series is now available and we hope you guys check it out. And as well, there are always free resources on our website at idpodcast.com, freebies, all different types of topics. So check out our website and we hope you guys enjoyed the show. 